Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another chapter on Experiencer Interviews. I'm Mr. Gray, and we're uh, welcoming again uh, an interviewee that I had the last time. His name is John Skullberg. And uh, we've, uh, we've briefly um, had the chance to delve into his, uh, what, we, what we call uh, avian entities, avian bird people, or avian extraterrestrials. And uh, his story was uh, totally awesome. And uh, when we uh, quit the interview, uh, we, we still, uh, we continued talking. And uh, a lot of, there was more info coming out and that, that wasn't, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't have the time to delve into uh, during the interview. So I, I asked uh, John to come back again and uh, try to, you know, try to get more information out of him. And he was kind enough to, to say yes. So John, uh, thanks for coming on again. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, so to, to do a, you know, like a complete story, let's recap the entire uh, avian story. When did, when did the uh, avian experiences start? Um, well, interestingly enough, um, and I think we touched on this the last interview a little bit, but um, I mean, the theme of, I guess, avian stuff started when I was very young. Um, well, my mom and dad, when I was young, we lived in Southern California in this place called San Clemente, California. And we had a house that kind of like almost overlooked the ocean. So uh, really nice, nice neighborhood. Um, anyways, I was, you know, and just to, for whatever reason, I have a really good memory. And, um, and luckily, I guess it's nice. But uh, yeah, so I was like three or four. and. Um, it was in the night and my bedroom was in the uh, top level, the second story. And I kind of had a longer in a room. Um, and at the very end of the room was a window that was facing the ocean. And anyways, middle of the night, I woke up and I looked through the window and I saw like three sets of glowing eyes and, you know, terrified. <laughs> and so, you know, was crying or and screaming and you know my dad runs up there you know I tell him what I saw and his his immediate explanation was oh those just have those must be owls um and the interesting thing is I didn't remember that until like literally just like three or four years ago and I don't really recall what triggered that memory um, why I did remember it, but, um, you know, ever since then, and I can't say what was in the window, um, but, you know, that was my dad's explanation, probably to try to calm me down or something. So as far as a theme in, in, in that regard, it started when I was pretty young. Um, the significant experience I had, which we kind of touched on, was in January of 2004 and I uh, just a little background at that point I I have Crohn's disease and have been dealing with it for like 20 years and so I, I was in kind of a, a period of time where I was in kind of bad shape at that point um, just feeling lousy and I was still young so I'd always tough it out you know and didn't have insurance so anyways just a lot of stuff I was dealing with and um, well, one night I was just basically reading a book before I went to sleep and pretty exciting reading, Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, more or less, I was reading, just sitting there. TV wasn't on, it was quiet. And uh, it was almost like I felt a presence a little bit. Um, and almost kind of immediately, I started feeling like I was in some kind of trance state or slowly kind of sliding into a trance state, so to speak. And I just remember I was staring at the ceiling and more or less <laughs> with, with my eyes remaining open, the room started to fade. First of all, I, before it started fading, it, it started becoming kind of like this, iridescent like undulating colors um 
in my eyesight. And then it started, you know, kind of fading to darkness. Um, at that point, you know, the room was, it basically dematerialized to me, essentially. Um, I knew I was in my room, but, um, you know, I couldn't see anything, um, just darkness. And uh, at that point, I got more or less kind of, I guess, I started speaking or someone was speaking to me, entity of some sort. Um, I wasn't entirely clear at that point who or what this was, um, but it more or less kept imparting to me that, you know, don't be afraid. If it can, if at all possible, try to stick with what's happening right here. And so the room's entirely dark, um, or it's dark to me. I'm not seeing anything. And then slowly but surely, it was like this pinhole of light. And it was the only thing that I could see in this darkness. And this voice who was, you know, speaking to me essentially was telling me, focus on the light. And, you know, you know if at all possible, don't just distract it. Just try to focus on that light and don't be afraid. So I'm looking at this light and it's as if the, the better I focus, the closer this light starts to, to come towards me. Because at first it's just like a very minute little light. And like almost as if you're in the darkest room possible and you had some big piece of black paper and you literally just pick a little hole through there. And on the other side, it's light coming through. So very interesting. And then I started having the sensation that I wasn't really sensing the room. I wasn't sensing the, the confining nature of a small room, it felt just like a big open space. And so, you know, I'm trying to stay calm. Uh, you know, part, part of my brain's like, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> but uh, just because of my curiosity, kind of like I maybe mentioned to you before, my curiosity always seems to kind of outweigh any fear that I have. So I was, you know, attempting to go along with what was happening. And um, as I said, the, you know, the room started kind of just fading to black. And then at that same, in that same moment, I was losing sense of my body. And um, that, you know, that was, that's kind of scary. Your body has, you know, obviously an instinct to be, hey, what's going on? So I'm looking at this light. I'm concentrating and as much as I can. And the light you know, starts to become a little bigger as if it's either I'm mo moving toward it or it's moving towards me. And uh, as I'm looking at the light, it's almost as if, as it's getting closer, it's like smoke's coming out of this light, uh, like a mist of some sort. And the closer this light gets, the more the sensation that my body isn't there. Um, and for a while, I actually was pretty calm. And uh, I was going with what was happening. And then as the experience starts to kind of get more intense, um, I start, you know, I'm telepathic, I guess, would be the best way to put it. Um, it was this, as if uh, this kind of image was like superimposed in front of my eyes. Even though I'm not sensing body or anything like that, my only sense was a visual thing. And so, yeah, as crazy as it sounds, basically whoever was, I mean, I know now, but the entity that was speaking to me, communicating with me, basically revealed himself to me. And um, I mean, it's still crazy to think about just to give you a visual, if anybody's played like video games where you have to create a character in the game, you know, you can like, um, you know, twist the character around and rotate the character. Well, that was kind of what was happening was like, he was, it was a demonstration, I guess, to present himself to me. And 
it was as if I was rotating around him slowly so I could see see all the details of who he was. A bit like this? And like moving around like exactly, that? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yep, yep. As if like in free space too. He's not standing on anything. You know, just... Okay. So, and then uh, <laughs> it was... The only way I could describe it was a bird man. <laughs> wow. um, but more more than that, um, he was enormous and extremely like muscular. But since I was able to see so much detail, I mean, I could see the feathers all all across his body, and then not only that, but you could see the various detail of feathers as as in like the feathers on his face were much smaller very small feathers um feathers on his chest were smaller he had the longer feathers on his shoulders and like on the sides of his body but he had a lot of smaller feathers in, in through the chest and his face was covered in feathers small ones um and no mouth that I could really see. The eyes, but they were like very small, um, or I couldn't really see them clearly, possibly. But the, um, you know, the one of the more um, incredible things, I guess, and I'll, I'll, I'll never forget it, was I was in complete like awe, I guess you know for lack of a better term it was as if i was i could sense that this this thing was in, incredibly ancient incredibly intelligent incredibly powerful and I, i'll never forget that because it was as if like you're <laughs> like you're in the presence of like a, a mythic you know being or something you know and um so you know i'm seeing i'm seeing this in my mind i guess even though i'm seeing it in my eyes and you know just blown away but also uh comforted in a certain sense because as i am having this experience seeing him he's also communicating to me and his the biggest message he kept imparting to me was that fear is an illusion and it's based on the conditions of our material self. So more or less, he was saying that fear is kind of based on the body. Um, that's not really a tangible condition that the mind or your spirit is really in touch with because we don't have, there's, there's somewhere within us that, the, the, that there is no fear. And so it was, you know, twofold. I was going through stuff in my life where that really was relevant to what was going on. But also, I think he was trying to help me continue to have the experience. So, you know, calming, you know, trying to calm me down in a certain way. And so all this is, you know, going on. And, you know, he basically continued to, you know, communicate to me and part to me that he was in a sense, a guardian and a sign to me and my life. And that that was his job, <laughs> essentially. And that um, if I ever ran into difficulties in my life or challenging times, that I could ask, you know, for help. And two things that were interesting. Um, more or less, he told me his name and said to me do this is only for you and you can't really tell anybody else because it doesn't doesn't matter to them um and that if i needed help that i would say his name three times now it seems cliche but more or less i think the idea was it takes some kind of concentration and so there's a man there's kind of like a manifesting in your mind if you repeat things and it's kind of like connecting, you know, a dial tone of some sort. And so, you know, all this is going on and maybe it was just the timing that 
you know, he imparted the message that I needed to hear. Oh, and also, you know, he, he was saying more or less that, you know, he, he, he's always around and that there could be times where, and I, it would be unknown to me, but there could be times where there could be influence in the world that would affect my life that he would be involved in. So it's got, you know, kind of mind blowing. Um, and so this is all happening. And then, you know, I started to get a little more like fearful, you know, just because I couldn't feel in my body and my mind started to kind of start thinking about my, the experience I was having. And I was like, Oh, okay, this is really crazy. And, mm. and then soon, sure enough, um, the pinprick of light showed up again. And as my concentration waned, it started to get smaller and smaller. And then it just dis disappeared in the room, rematerialized. And there I was. And the guesstimate I, I made at the time was that that all occurred in about 35 minutes. And the thing that kind of, in addition, that kind of blew my mind is I knew my eyes were open the whole time. Like I, I knew they were. Um, and I didn't have like dry eyes or anything like that. Um, so that was, <laughs> that was an experience that really um, obviously was a huge event for me. And, you know, it, I didn't, it took many years for me to even talk about that. And my wife is really the first person I, to, I don't know, actually be honest, she may be the only person I had told about this. And since then, I've been more comfortable talking about it. But, um, you know, I, I told her about this. We've been together almost eight years. So I told her about this years ago. Um, so, and I had never heard anybody I'd never heard anything like that before. Um, and I it just, I'd never have. And so I don't know if you want to get into it now, but you know, I ran into information a couple of years ago where someone was talking about this mm -hmm. and I was floored. Um, and, and the, and the interesting thing was, is we, uh, my wife and my mother-in-law, we were just traveling back from a small little, kind of convention thing in southern Colorado and so we were driving on our way back home and just listening to some things interviews and things like that and sure enough you know someone started talking about that and I literally had to pull over because I was just I, part of me was just blown away I just could not believe it because you know still there's part of me like ah oh, there's no way you know there's no way that's what happened to me is you know that's it's not real or something you know there's part of you that wants to doubt it, you know? And, um, so anyways, you know, that was, I guess in a nutshell, that was kind of the primary experiences for me in terms of, of, I guess, bird people. <laughs> um, I, I, I would like to call them something else because bird people doesn't seem sufficient, but you know, I don't, I couldn't tell you, uh, where he had, he's, is from or you know anything like that I don't have I don't have a lot of details in terms of that but there's been moments since then that you know there's been communication here and there okay. um, how did you feel when you uh, when you got corroboration that what you've been through others have been through as well because you know this the, you, you got stories online on TV so how did you feel I, I mean, blown away, to be honest with you. I mean, I would just, I couldn't believe it. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it still kind of blows me away um, just because it's just, it seems so strange and, and, and just weird, you know, like why would there, why would there be a being that looks like, you know, like has the aspects of a bird, but is also like has a body and, you know, stuff like that, you know? So to me, it was mind blowing and, 
you know, obviously I looked a little more into it at that point because I was like, wow, what are, what are these people talking about? Like, I need to know, you know. So, yeah, I guess, you know, just very surprised and kind of excited. Well, excited for sure, because I felt, one, that maybe there's more information out there for me. Um, and two, maybe there's other people that have, uh, you know, some other kind of similar experience and maybe we could maybe I could uh, exchange information, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't know, but it definitely opened the door in terms of talking about it. All right. Uh, the, well, then when I came out, um, uh, when I started talking about one of my shadow experience, uh, shadow beings, um, thanks to that, others contacted me and said that they went through the same thing. They, they saw these huge shadow beings with really large, broad shoulders, and uh, right. no neck, but they had a huge round helmet on them. And I had five wow. in my bedroom, so, you know, you, I couldn't bend this thing up. And, uh, but right, yeah, right. Yeah, thanks to that, uh, others got help. And I got help as well because uh, I thought it was crazy. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it wasn't the case. Um, but uh, so down the road, have you ever had more communication with those types of beings? Yeah, you know, a couple times. Um, but they weren't like, um, there was no like real big revelation in those moments. It was more like a psychological support, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Um, cause I've had a lot of surgeries and, you know, one thing I, I guess I forgot to mention was that, um, he more or less imparted to me that it was really important that I not, you know, like lean too much on this idea that he's there to help me, that it's only in times where I feel kind of like I have depleted all my resources within myself. Um, because there was, I guess, more or less what he was saying was it's really important that you, if you can, try to do things on your own, try to have the full experience of whether it's painful, disappointment, or joy, or happiness, that, you know, it's kind of a reason why we're here is to, we don't necessarily need someone to hold our hand. But, you know, in times of dire need, there could be help and, you know, stuff like that. So um, nothing too, you know, not a lot of revelation or information since then. Um, but I gander, guess, and I feel it within myself that I will in the future. Um, I don't know. It's just a gut gut feeling I have. <laughs> so, but you know, I will say just uh, just to add too. Um, interestingly enough, and I didn't mention anything about this, but I I had met a lady who had told me she had experience was experiences with a blue avian type being um and this was i met her last year and it was very coincidental i mean we do i was at a discussion group about you know subjects like this i mean they cover all kinds of things we talk about all kinds of things and i'm not necessarily a regular i, I try to go as much as i can but um someone had started talking about it in the in the group and uh i didn't say anything and I didn't mention anything. She didn't either during the group, but my wife had, we just started, we were talking outside after the group, after the meeting and just, you know, hanging out with folks. And yeah, sure enough, um, she hadn't, you know, none of this, I don't know if it's a similar experience. I didn't get a lot of details out of her because she, she said she'd rather, you know, have a more longer conversation about it. And I haven't really got the, chance to do that with her since then but so that was that is the only other person that i had ever sp spoken to personally mm -hmm. um but uh yeah i mean well it's, it's fun means. to it's fun to get corroboration um uh like like we spoke earlier uh when i went to laughlin at, at starworks in 2018 i believe um i met a lady uh, I spoke at the experiencer gathering in the, in the morning and a, a lady after that got up and she was in her 80s and she had a huge speech impediment and um, later on I found out why is well I mean, the whole thing is that she had a Venusian 
a, a male Venusian speak to her telepathically and he wished to enter her body and uh, to, to be able to live out the human experience, what it, what it meant to be human, you know, the, all the, the good and the bad. And she agreed. And uh, one day she, I think she was on a bridge or, uh, or there was maybe cars and then the bridge collapsed and, every, and she felt falling down and she felt hands grab her head. And I think because of that, she was the only one to survive the, uh, the fall. And the only blowback was she had something wrong with her, uh, her mouth. So she, she really had trouble speaking, but she had the courage to tell her story. And right. um, from that on, uh, she started doing C5s. And I, I think she, her, she told that, um, she said that her, her husband worked as a, a spy. I'm not, for, mm -hmm. I'm not sure with her, for what agency, but um, eventually um, she, she got the, uh, the visit of a general, I believe. And behind her were, uh, behind him was, were, were two men in black. And when the, they asked to enter the house, um, she felt super afraid of the two men at the back because they, they looked identical and the energy that you know, they, they gave off was really freaky. And the general said that she had to stop doing these C5s and stuff. And uh, of course, she told him off. She wasn't really afraid. But um, yeah, to, to have somebody you know, give corroboration about, I, I wasn't too sure about the whole Valiant Thor thing, you know, Frank Strange's. And uh, you know, I, I, I saw videos on the net that de debunked them sometimes, which is, you know, understandable. Some people don't believe. But then to have this elderly lady who had a speech impediment come up and talk to, talk to us. I think that, was, that might have been the first time that she ever spoke of it. So to have her have the courage to, 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 you know, to, to speak in front of everyone and to tell her story about the Venusians really gave credit and more like, I guess, corroboration to what you know, I've heard in the past. So now I'm really right. you know, tilting to, to the, okay, this has actually happened. So, so again, yeah. to have your story, uh, you know, meeting up somebody else who went through the same thing is totally mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And you know, um, another little detail that just popped in my head—I forgot to. Uh, I think we may have touched on it after our last interview, but mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> this was in two thousand two, and uh, one of those lucid dreaming type of experiences and my instinct tells me or i feel strongly that um this message in 2002 may have been also my guardian blue avian friend <laughs> and it is it's a, it's a really wild thing because it was kind of like i guess for lack of a better term a download or you know some kind of mental exchange of information somehow, um, but it was a really, I guess, it was a visual experience that was trying to communicate a very complicated concept. And anyways, the crazy thing about it is, and like I said, you know, I hadn't heard anything about this until a couple of years ago, so this idea that was basically given to me um the description <laughs> at least told to me and i think it was just to help me il or illustrate in my mind to try to kind of get a grasp of it it was it was called the multi-dimensional shared memory matrosphere <laughs> and <laughs> you know i was like okay so anyways um it's kind of a complicated explanation in terms of like our psychological, mental, and spiritual self, the invisible aspects of who we are, and how memories are overlapped with each other, even with strangers. And so there's this, you know, I guess the old adage, everything is connected, but it was more, uh, way more detailed than that. And it was... I mean, there's a lot of detail. I, I would take a long time to go through it, but more or less, it was kind of telling me that, or imparting to me that there is aspects in the world and, and events and things and just behaviors of humans and other living organisms 
that kind of put a trajectory on life. And that that trajectory could kind of be used to, I guess, predict the future, to, so, so to speak, or forecast what could happen. And so, I mean, it was, it was a lot of stuff and it just seemed like it was in my, it was almost like a seed was put in my head with this idea and I didn't fully understand it. But as time went on, <clears throat> actually let me put it this way, it just wasn't a seed. It was almost like if you picture like a, a fishing net that you would use to, you know, catch fish with, it was like, there was something input within me that as I went through my life going forward from that moment, that whatever relevant information I needed to help me understand this idea, it would happen. And so that's kind of what has happened ever since then. And like I said, my gut feeling is that that was the same, I guess, my guardian, just like I said. And at that point, though, there's, you know, I didn't, no visuals, there wasn't anything clear in terms of who I was speaking with. But, I, you know, after my it took me a little bit of time to make that connection um and so the interesting about, thing about that is when i ran into the information about blue avians you know a couple years ago there was a discussion about something about spheres or like this or like an alliance of spheres and you know that too so those two things <laughs> someone talking about bird people and then something you know someone talking about spheres I was like, you know, and that's when I was telling you, I was driving, you know, back from that conference, I had to pull over because there's those two things just seemed so far out of the realm of like having someone else talk about it. I just wouldn't had never thought, you know, because there's still parts of yourself when you have crazy experiences, you're like, man, you know, maybe I'm just crazy, you know, but when like you're saying you get confirmation and then when it gets real detailed, you you know you, you you just feel it inside you you know there's a, it resonates and there's even like there's excitement and also this kind of like adrenaline of kind of not fear but like wow you know the world and the universe is way bigger than i can even understand and in my regular everyday life you know you're distracted by everything but here is this immense truth and sometimes you can't you know sometimes it's even hard to think about because a lot of the stuff that we have during our lives see, seems so like insignificant and minuscule. So I just wanted to add that because that was a that was another aspect of this that it took a little while for me to kind of put the pieces together, but I definitely feel those two things were related related. Okay. Um to to fall back to the uh to when you were a kid and when you had the uh the avian experience. Um did you say that you were about to fall asleep, like in the in between uh, of being asleep and not being asleep? Sort of. Uh, you know, um, I was reading a book, so you know, and I was at this point, I I would read before I fall asleep. Yeah. So yeah, I was definitely kind of in a state of like I could probably close my eyes and fall asleep. Because so yeah, there, kind of in that in between, you know. That's um, I did the uh, I, well, I didn't I didn't know this before, but. That's a sort of state where at the Monroe Institute, uh, we do uh, what we do. It's called the, the, uh, the gateway program, I believe, is where you try to you, 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 like you sort of meditate and you, you, you listen to this music and you really calm yourself down to a sort of state that just before you fall asleep. But you try to stay awake and try to be in that in between. And that's when you start receiving visions. And uh, I just finished college. Uh, I was 25. I was finishing. I was just. I just finished my second course. Uh, well, I had my second degree, and I, I was finally on my own for the first time. And I was living in uh, another city, and uh, I was. I went to bed, and um, I was looking at the uh, my uh, what you call it. Uh, okay. So I was looking at something in the in the bedroom, and uh, I was I was sleeping on my side. And I was sort of in between, I was awake, fully aware, but then the air in front of me starts to bubble up. Like there was this, 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 a sphere of sorts, okay? Uh, uh, something round, but you imagine energy, energy rising from hot pavement, it, like that. Okay? Right, right. So I was seeing that and said, oh my God, what am I thinking? What am I looking at? And so I started concentrating on the energy and what I'm seeing in that bubble of rising energy, 
is my brother's face uh, tilted to the side, his eyes were closed, and it felt to me like he was drowning. Because huh. you know, let's say like a head was falling slowly towards the bottom of the lake. So the, you know, you know these things might have been bubbles, and he was drowning. And I was freaked out, and uh, so I called my mom. Then you know the next day, and I tell her the story. What I find out later, a week later, is my, that my brother, he was at the uh, the emergency, getting massive blood transfusions because of the he was ta- um, he was given methotrexate, I think, for his he had um, ulcerative uh, ulcerative colitis, and he was getting yeah. that. And his body was rejecting it, and he, you know that that, but that type of med- I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's that one, but another uh, a specific uh, medication for his uh, problem was killing him. Because mm. you know it, 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 there was a sort of a, a range of certain people that didn't go well with that medication, but the, you know the doctors still gave it to him, and it was killing him, and he was on massive blood transfusions for an entire week. So I had a vision of my brother. A week beforehand that something was going to happen to him so that's my when, when i get visions and stuff like that or uh clear audient messages it's all right uh, it's already uh it's, it's related to my family my immediate family that something's going to happen so i guess in your case you've sort of went in between and there you were sort of in a, in a, a mental state that it's easier for them to communicate i i yeah i totally i totally um I agree hundred um, percent because I've had a, I've had, well, I, I told you a little bit. I, I mean, I've had so many strange experiences, like um, even you just talking about the hospital, like it brought out, I just thought of, I mean, real quick. I, um, so I, you know, I had Crohn, I've had Crohn's disease for a long time. When I first got sick in 2001, where I got really sick, I was in the hospital for like 30 days, 30 something days. And I know I'll never forget this. It was very, very peculiar. So I, I'd been in this hospital for, at this point about three weeks. And, you know, if you've been in the hospital, you know, it's like almost impossible to get any rest. You know, there's nurses coming in, check your vitals, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And well, you get, you know, you've been there long enough. You get used to your nurses, you know, their rounds, you know, who's got what shift and things like that. And I remember middle of the night, you know, like I literally had just fallen asleep not that long before this. A nurse walks in and it's a guy. I'd never seen him before. And he had the funniest like Dutch, Dutch boy haircut. Like it just looks so strange, you know, bangs like right here. And, and he had this accent, like, um, like a Scandinavian accent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's asking me how I'm doing. And, you know, they're, it's not uh, all that unnormal to have a nurse you're not used to because some, you know, some people fill in and things like that. But it was, it was very strange because, you know, he's listening to me when I was, I'm telling him what my condition is. And at this point, my doctors and I had just determined I need to have major surgery. Like I just, I couldn't deal with this pain anymore. And that was basically what I needed to do. Well, anyways, this nurse, this guy is telling me I shouldn't do it. And that I should look into other things. Mm-hmm. And I, I, you know, at the time, I'm only like 22 or 23. You know, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, man, like here I am almost dead. You know, you're telling me not to do anything about it. Mm-hmm. But um, I'll never forget that. Like, I, I'd never seen the guy before or after. And it was kind of almost a little offensive to me at the time when he was telling me this because I'm in bed and, you know, I'm feeling horrible. But, you know, later, as, you know, as time went on in my life, I always think about that as something, it seemed like something was connected there with this guy. And I don't know exactly what he was trying to impart to me in terms of my health, but part of me feels like that was, I don't even know if that was a real person. Yeah. Um, So (laughs) that was just another thing that popped in my head. Sorry, I got a little sidetracked, but I thought it was interesting. I feel I feel like it has something to do with the narrative of my, of my life too, a little bit. So um, anyways, I thought I'd share that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, you know, I've heard a lot of stories, of, you know, similar stories. Uh, a friend of mine, he was in a really bad accident and um, like he's, a, he's an abductee and uh, he was looking at outside the window and he was seeing three faces looking back 
but he's like at the second or third story window. Oh, wow. And then, you know, the nurse pops in and says, hey, did you see the, you know, the faces in the window? Like, like a, a family of sorts looking back. I said, no, there's nothing. We're, we're way too up. So, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of freaky stuff happening. Um, yeah, so. yeah I, it makes you wonder, too. Like, I, I've never had the experience, but, you know, his accent and everything, you know, I, I'm thinking, like, you know, as, as I got older and ran across information about, like, Nordic, yeah. you know, people, um, you know, there wasn't anything incredibly, you know, like he wasn't glowing or anything. He looked very normal. So um, I don't know, but I do feel like there's something to that. Um, mm -hmm. so anyway. <laughs> it is comforting to know that you've got help when you, you, you do want to ask for it. Because, you know, I do understand that, you know, we're living in the, you know, we're experiencing the human condition. We've, we've got sort of, you know, certain contracts going on. Uh, so we're supposed to lift or out certain things. I went through major heart surgery, so you know my chest was open, and uh, so yeah, you know, I've I've known the pains of having like multiple needles and tests. I was there for like 18 days, and uh, you know I prayed a lot, and um, so it really helped out. Uh, but knowing that I've been through ma through many um, it, like out of this world experiences, sort of prepped me up for. Okay, I didn't care if I was going to die or not. I knew what was hap what, what's going to happen. So I guess in your case as well, knowing that there's something beyond the veil helps you with your condition. Yeah, yeah, you're totally right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you, you know, I think I said this on our interview, you know, like that time period too, um, in 2001, when I had the major surgery, you know, I had a near-death experience because I had to have emergency surgery. And... You know, had a whole number of experiences. Well, I had an experience under anesthesia, which you normally never remember. Yeah. And then this whole Pandora's box of paranormal stuff also started to happen for me. So, yeah, um, yeah I'm sure you can remember. I mean, health things can really shock your system and your mind. And sometimes mm -hmm. you poke through on the other side of the veil, you know? like I thought... Um, you know, the, the years coming up to the, the surgery, I thought that perhaps I had like one foot in the tomb or like a, maybe a toe in the tomb and, you know, the rest of the body was out. And because of that, I was sort of in between because I, I had a lot of, you know, being felt up my, at night and uh, the, um, you know, the trash bin would, would open and close hmm. at, at 12, only once, at 12, around 1230 in one of my, my ex British contactee even said, so What was that? And I said, Oh, don't worry, it's only the trash bin. <laughs> Imagine that, because I wasn't sure. Uh, you know, at first, when it started to open and close, I thought, What was that? Because, you know, the sun was really close by and I was in bed. So the next morning, I started, you know, going in the kitchen and, you know, moving the drawers, you know, opening the cupboards, and nothing was, got, you know, made that sound until I opened the trash bin. It was like a normal like 18 liter white plastic trash bin. And right. I, I opened and closed it and said, oh, that's the sound. So this would happen like maybe once or twice a month. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, and I thought, okay, well, this, I, this was a new house. So this couldn't have been like somebody who died. Cause I, I used to, as soon as I got into the house, I started saging the house. And I said, I, all my ancestors, if you want to come in the house, you want to come and visit you're you're open to it as long as you protect you know the house from bad entities i'm not yes. sure if i sort of invited anything but when i moved to my, when i had to sell and i moved to my dad's place everything continued i still started going oh. to yeah I, yeah I got you know people i felt touched up that would wake, they wake me up i got electric shocks to the head you know at, at one 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 in the morning um and so on so yeah there's gotcha. uh so but as soon as I had the operation, not too long after, my ex you know, all the, the major hardcore stop, stuff stopped. So was, so was it going sort of, sort of to, to prep me up for the, the operation and you know, to give me courage? And then, okay, okay you're, 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 you're okay now. So we're letting you go on with your life. Right. Now, I, I've had other stuff, like a clear audience stuff that, so it gave me alarm uh, that, that something was going to happen to my dad, 
which later did the next day because he was, at, was at, in the woods hunting and he had an arrow go through his, his calf. Oh my gosh. But I, yeah, but the night before, I heard my dad's voice in my head saying my name. And that woke me up and I was freaked out and I knew something was wrong. So, when, so the next morning I thought, oh, my, girl, my dad's with his girlfriend in the woods. You know, there's, there's someone with him until she calls up at 10 a.m. saying, your dad's lost. But man, my, my dad's a hunter. He's never lost. Then I, then I, so I, I jump in the car and I drive really fast. And my dad calls up on his cell phone because, you know, they, they've got uh, reception. And he said, um, hurry up. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm lost, whatever. So, you know, that's impossible. But I find out later when I get to the camp that he, he, was, he was there, but he had an arrow through his leg and he was, he was starting to get delusional because of the, you know, the, the loss of blood. So, oh, wow. So I, we, he, he, his girlfriend doesn't drive fast, but so I was with my truck in the woods. So he hopped with, uh, on with me and I drove super fast with you know, all, all, all four flashers flashing and I, <laughs> right to the hospital. And that probably saved his life. And, and right. Said, so, yeah, so it, we do have guardian angels of sorts. We do have people yes. watching. So, you know, those watching, trust me, there's, you know, there's somebody watching you right Absolutely. now. So it's, it's comforting. Yep. I, I would say you're hundred percent right about that. Yeah. So do you have anything else, anything else to add on that you might've um, missed? Actually, yeah. Yeah. You gave me a little, um, little tidbit of information I thought was interesting because you were just talking about, you know, your experience and the, you know, as far as, having health issues, you know, how, you, and we could relate that mm -hmm. there is part of our minds and bodies, I think that have kind of popped over on the other side. And there's a concept called the silver string. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but it's the idea that there's some kind of mechanism, so to speak, that keeps our souls and our invisible aspects of ourself contained in the body. Yeah, yeah. And that when you cut that silver string, that's, yeah one you could be you know passed on or in, in in my mind i think that you could have a near-death experience and the experience is kind of traveling down the silver string mm -hmm. um and maybe that's why i saw the pinprick of light you know like it was silver light and i don't know i ran across that years ago after all these experiences and it just got me thinking that there might be something to it and it you know it has to do with you know near death and your soul and and your spirit in your body and how those things can be separated. Um, do you so feel maybe, that, well, do you feel yeah. that you had an out of body experience when you saw that small light? Yes. And oh, you, absolutely. Could it, could it have been a tunnel of sorts that you went into? Cause you felt, you felt drawn to it. Yes, it does. It kind of feels like that. I mean, for me, I didn't get the sense of a tunnel, but it really did appear as almost as if if I, it feels like if I concentrated enough and was able to do that, I could possibly go through that hole. Okay. Um, but I didn't get that far. So, uh -huh. but part of me feels I think that you're right about that. I mean, definitely out of body. That was part of the reason why I got a little scared and it kind of disrupted the whole experience there. But uh, yeah, definitely out of body. Okay. So I guess we'll uh, we'll wrap it up with that. All right. And uh, so to everyone watching, uh, many thanks. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, more Experiencer interviews coming up. I've got people lined up. So if you like this content, uh, click on the like button. And uh, I'll see you guys next time.